Messier 36. I'll tell you about Messier 36. It is an open cluster. Here's a picture of it as taken with two micron all sky survey, the two mass survey. So it's an infrared image of this particular open cluster. It really doesn't look particularly dramatic as with many open clusters. And in fact, as with many open clusters, there isn't a whole lot to say about the cluster itself. It was actually discovered way back in the 17th century. It made its way into Messier's list because actually he independently found it. There's a bunch of open clusters in this particular part of the sky and this is just one of them. It's in Auriga, I think, if you know your constellations. It's kind of middle of the road, about 4,000 light years away. It's about, I think, a few tens of millions of years old. So it's not young, it's not old, it's nothing particularly dramatic. What I was going to talk about which you can just about see in this picture, is that. Oh, what is that? Yeah, OK. Can you see it? It looks a bit redder than everything else. What, what am it, I looking at? It's a bit redder, and it's clearly not a point-like object. It's actually got a tail. It was discovered more or less by chance. It was discovered by people who are making observations of this open cluster and imaging it fairly deeply. Um, and they found this rather weird-looking object. They were actually sufficiently intrigued by it. They gave it a name, so it's actually got a name. It's called Holoia. It's Hawaiian for flowing gas, I believe. Is that object part of the cluster? Is it in the foreground? Is it in the background? That's a good question, and that's kind of part of the story. So the people who discovered it um, had a look at it in more detail. Let's see if I can find you a better picture from their paper. Okay, and so they started studying it and trying to figure out what it is. And they came to the conclusion it's actually kind of an interesting object in that it looks like it's a very young star. As with everything in astronomy, astronomers classify things. They classify stars as they're forming. And so like a class one protostar is something where it's still kind of completely surrounded by the kind of cocoon of gas and dust from which it formed. So you can really only see it in the infrared. It hasn't come out of its swaddling cloth. Exactly, it's still kind of in the nursery at that point. And a class two is when it's kind of turned into, into a real kind of pre-main sequence object. So it actually really is emerged as a star. It's not yet a kind of settled down as a normal star, but at least you can see this a stellar-like object there. And one of the sort of mysteries is the process by which stars evolve through these various stages. And their suggestion in this paper about th this object is that they've kind of caught an object in the act. It's coming somewhere between this type 1 and type 2. In the, you can actually see the star, but it's actually still very bright in the infrared. Um, so it looks like it's sort of in, in the act of emerging from its cocoon. I mean, that's the story. And then so then we've got to start trying to explain this rather strange sort of shape to it, this morphology. Of, so there's the star that's sort of emerging. And then the question is, well, what's this here? And the answer is it's almost certainly an outflow, which gets us back to this name hollow ear and the, the flowing gas, that it's probably an outflow of gas. Now, the interesting thing is when you have an outflow of gas like this from an object, it happens all the time in all sorts of astronomical objects. But almost always, because of the symmetry of the object, if you've got like a star or whatever in the middle, if you've got stuff going that way, sort of from the pole of the star, you'll also have stuff going that way. It's just kind of the symmetry of the thing. You almost always have these bipolar outflows. Whereas this, in this case, of course, you can actually only see one outflow. So they did quite a lot of modelling to try and figure out what was going on and try and figure out if they could come up with an explanation for it. They came up with various possibilities and probably the, the most straightforward one is this one here where you've got a star and it's kind of a, the, the cocoon of material around it is slowly dissipating but there's still a disk of material around it which presumably eventually might form some planets or whatever. It's the kind of the, the leftover remnants of the star forming. And if you think about it, if there were actually an, an outflow of material this side and an outflow of material this side, but we were viewing the thing from kind of somewhere over here, the outflow going out the other way would be hidden behind this disk, which if it's still very opaque, you won't be able to see. So they suggested the reason why you kind of see this unipolar outflow is actually there's probably a bipolar outflow, but you don't get to see the second one for some reason. So it was kind of a nice story, and if it had stopped there, it would be great, and that's probably where we ought to stop the video. However, as with most things, it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that. So for a start, there's this question of whether this object is actually in the messy object we're looking at. And they also pointed out in this paper, if you look at kind of the bigger picture of what's going on. So here's an image of a patch of the sky. The thing that we've been looking at is down here. And the contours you can see on here, the lines on here, are lines of where there's infra showing you where there's infrared emission, which is typically associated with star formation. And so there's this massive star formation region up here, and you can see it kind of extends almost all the way down to the thing we're looking at here. And so it looks like that probably this object just happens to be, I mean, the reason why they found it is because they were looking at this Messier object, but it's probably actually physically associated with this thing up here rather than the Messier object itself. Yeah, and I think it's a bit further away, so it's actually behind it, but we just happen to be seeing it kind of projected in the same direction. So that's one half of the kind of complications. And then the other half of the complications is, as I say, they had this nice picture of what might be going on. 
but then foolishly they decided to collect some more data. So they went and looked at it with submillimeter telescopes, which actually tell you about molecules, which is quite good because when you're looking at very dense gas from which stars are forming, there's usually lots of molecules around. So here's their kind of the summary picture from their subsequent paper. Carbon monoxide, HCN, HCO+, a whole bunch of different molecules. And the answer is, it turns out there isn't actually one object there. There's at least two objects. There's one peak there and another peak there. And actually in different molecules, the peaks seem to occur in different places. So it looks like this whole thing is actually a complete mess. It's not just one star with stuff emerging from it. It's actually several stars, most of which are still deeply embedded that you can only see in these molecular uh, observations. And then just one of the stars in this little subcluster is starting to emerge from the cocoon. And probably it might even be one of these other stars. The cocoon around that is what's obscuring so you don't see the, the kind of the counter jet. It's not actually obscuring it itself. It could well be one of its little friends. So it's really, I mean, the, the lesson that comes away from this, I guess, is that star formation is a really messy process. And the more closely you look at it, the messier it gets. As an astronomer who is interested in star formation to a fair extent, does that make you more excited or is it more exasperated about your job? <laughs> it's kind of, it's like the difference between weather and climate, right? In that actually, if you're not careful, you end up doing the weather forecasting, even if you're interested in climate. And actually what I'm interested in this context is kind of the climate, what's the big picture thing of what's going on in the universe in the long term. And as I say, if you're not careful, if you look too much detail at any given object, you get kind of sidetracked into studying the weather, studying the, the finicky details of that particular object. And so it, it's always the case when you look at a single object like that, that's what you'll end up doing. But of course, if we look at a whole bunch of objects like that, we can see what the things are that occur in all of them and start seeing those more general patterns as about what's going on with star formation. There are a few systems like this, uh, they're quite rare, and I guess the two factors are these things are actually quite faint because they're still fairly well embedded, so which means you can only see relatively nearby examples. So actually the kind of the volume of the universe we can find these things in is quite small. And they're quite short-lived. And so actually the chances of catching a star near enough to the Earth and at exactly this phase in its lifetime is actually quite small. So there's not that many of them we will get to see. How long would this undressing, this stepping out of the swaddling cloth process last? Like, like I don't know. I would, well, actually, interestingly, so there's a, a picture of this object, kind of an archival picture, no one noticed it was there, that was taken in the 1950s, that the people who were studying it looked at, and then they, they compared it to their, their latest picture from, I think, the 1990s when they got their data. And the object had changed significantly in brightness on that timescale. So even on a timescale of less than 50 years, this thing is actually evolving very energetic so we can start observing the formation of those stars and the formation of the solar systems around those stars because it's really cold and you can't see it in the optical because it's completely hidden in the dust cloud right uh, we can observe some of the very earliest galaxies that were formed